so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's August 2005 and Nicola Gobbo's life is about to go in a direction she never anticipated. She hopes to be hit by a car or a tram, anything to get her out of the mess she's currently in. She's a successful defence barrister, best known for defending Melbourne's most prolific organised crime figures, from Carl Williams to Tony Mockbell. But things have become very messy. She wants to get what she calls the Mockbell monkey off her back. She's become too involved in ways she says she never intended. She'll later say she's tired of being stood over by criminals who are manipulating the justice system. Nicola is scared, she's distressed, and she's about to break down. I can vividly remember thinking, I just can't keep going. I can't do this anymore, she told the ABC. When she arrives at the courthouse and finds two detectives standing outside, words spill out of her mouth and tears fall down her face. She tells them things she shouldn't. The detectives see this as an opportunity and suggest something that's never been done before. Her decision that day would affect more than a thousand people and ultimately force her into hiding. The most resounding question when it comes to Nicola's behaviour is, why? Why did she make the decision she did? And there's one woman best positioned to answer that. Everyone was looking for Nicola Gobbo. Lawyers wanting answers, hundreds of other journalists. And my most pressing concern, half of Melbourne's criminal underworld. But only me and my colleague Josie Taylor had managed to make contact. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Rachel Brown. Rachel is a Walkley Award-winning investigative journalist, author and podcaster. Rachel is the host of ABC's true crime podcast, Trace. The second season of Trace investigates the story of criminal defence lawyer turned police informer Nicola Gobbo, who's most popularly known as Lawyer X. You can find a link to Rachel's podcast, Trace, in the show notes. I'm going to start at the end. Do you have any idea where in the world Nicola Gobbo is right now? No, I don't. So the last time she called me was from Brisbane when she was coming into Brisbane Airport with her two children. And as I explained in the podcast, she was escorted by three groups of police, Queensland Police and then New South Wales Police, and then finally crossed the Victorian border. And it was there that she later sent an audio recording to her lawyer, which he passed on to my colleague Josie and I at the ABC to say that she was then given an ultimatum, go back into hiding or risk being separated from your children. They have said to me that if I step foot into Melbourne, and then they went so far as to say any airport in Australia, they will take steps to immediately remove the children from me because they say that there is the potential risk of harm to me and that therefore the kids being proximate to me enlivens that risk. And so the next time I heard her voice was at the Royal Commission in February. But at the moment, because of that ultimatum, I don't know where in the world her and her two kids are. That's partly bittersweet for me because as a storyteller, you want to know how the story ends and as a human being, you know, but part of me is glad. I don't know. I would rather not know. I think it's safer for her. Mm. And I think it's just one of those things that it's safer for her and the kids. And that theme of safety and her being pursued or, or threatened by anyone knowing where she is obviously comes through the whole podcast. Who is pursuing her? What is the greatest threat to her right now? This is a really interesting question. So when I started looking into whether or not doing an interview with her somewhere would be safe, I assumed, because that's what I'd heard as a journalist, that she was at threat from being hurt by 
people with underworld connections, maybe former clients that she'd betrayed. Like that's the narrative that Victoria Police has put out. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's that's just what I've heard mm. in documents before the Royal Commission back in 2014 that had her placed in the highest risk category there was. And this was when they were trying to get her to enter the witness protection program. So I've read all of that stuff and there's various groups that Victoria Police thinks might want to hurt Nicola Gobbo now that they know that she was secretly acting as a police informer. But if you ask Nicola, which I have done, every time I had an assumption about her, she kind of threw me for six because I said, I just assume that you're in danger. Her view of it, and again, this could be wrong, is that she feels like Victoria Police just want to make it seem like she's in danger so that they can keep controlling her and what she does and where she is and what she says. She thinks that she's not in as much danger as Victoria Police says she is. She thinks that a lot of the people that she is said to have betrayed, like she's more useful to them as they're going through their appeals in trying to get out of jail or have their sentences reduced, for example. And her argument is that she feels more in danger from Victoria Police, be it because they want to silence her or if there's any corrupt elements that might have things to hide. So that was a very new perspective that I hadn't thought about before. And again, I want to make it clear to your listeners, I don't know which one's right because both parties have their reasons for making these arguments. But the argument that she most recently made to me is that, you know, if Victoria Police were genuinely concerned about the children, she said that she hadn't heard of it ever interfering in the families of gangland players. Mm. You know, you'd remember there were many men that were being hunted and actively hunted and shot at. Jason Moran, this was the big one that people would remember in 2003, was shot in the front of his minivan with like his three kids in the back. That does, I was talking to my colleague Josie Taylor about this, and then that does, to play devil's advocate, help you understand Victoria Police's argument, I suppose, because, you know, those kids potentially were in danger. But Nicola says, well, those kids were never, you know, no one ever discussed removing those kids from their dad. So she thinks she's being singled out, and she thinks it's a way of Victoria Police using her kids as psychological blackmail, I suppose, to keep her hidden away and to keep her quiet. Going back to the beginning, where did Nicola grow up and what was her childhood like? She came from a quite a prestigious family and that's what we heard about in the press. You know, her uncle was a former governor and Supreme Court judge. Her cousin is a QC. Her sister is a um, commercial barrister. But she, when she tells the story, she says she came from quite humble beginnings. Her parents were immigrants. Their parents started a soup kitchen in Carlton. And so she says that she wasn't born with a silver spoon in her mouth. And the way she describes it is that she was taught from a very young age that if you're not a hard worker, you're stealing Mm. from your parents. So she says for her to be able to go to a private girls' school, she went to Genazano, was actually quite a big thing and quite an impost for her family. And the first time she found herself on the wrong side of the law was at Melbourne University. What did she do? She had asked a security guard, Brian Wilson, to move in with her and she claims that she didn't know he was a drug dealer. And then police ended up raiding her Carlton flat where she was living with Brian and found cannabis and speed. I think he ended up getting a conviction but a suspended sentence for that, but she escaped a conviction and that was, I think, her first brush with the law because... You know, as you know, with a conviction, that would have made it awfully hard for her to become a lawyer. In a way, that was her introduction to talking to the police, I think, to giving them crumbs of information because Brian Wilson went away, came back, and she ended up dobbing him into the police and saying he's back and he's abusive and violent and can you help me get him out? So she was part of an undercover sting on Brian Wilson that was going to involve an undercover police officer. But one of the guys in the undercover unit said, we can't use Nicola, she's a loose cannon. She'd ended up choosing the name of the undercover officer herself, you know, and making decisions that should have been made by Victoria Police. That sting was abandoned, but they registered her as an informer in that year in 1995 without her knowing. And they did again in 1999. Same deal. She says she didn't know. So she saw it as giving crumbs of information to the police, but they saw her back then as quite a useful helper, I suppose. 
And she was studying law then and then went on to enter law because she did escape that conviction. Yeah. Her first job was working for a man named Alex Lewenberg, who noticed that she was socialising with clients of the firm and police. Why was that a problem? Why was that something that concerned him a little bit? I think optically it's not a good look, you know, if you're getting too close to clients nor if you're getting too close to police. So he was one of the ones that says he warned her to try to keep her distance. But back then, I think this was in the late 90s and the start of the 2000s, she was socialising with her clients. You know, a lot of them said that she'd be more comfortable not talking in her chambers, but just talking in a cafe or at the pub. So a lot of her business was done, I think it used to be called Wheat, which was a cafe under her chambers. There were whispers about her social life that actually pervaded much of her career. What were those whispers? What were people saying about her? What do you mean in terms of the the type of woman that she was? In terms of the type of woman she was and perhaps the type of relationships that she was having with these men. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So a lot that's come out at the Royal Commission have spoken about relationships that she's had with police officers, for example. She was in a relationship with one in the late 90s. She says she slept with a officer who was one of the ones that registered her in 1999. He denies that. He's also sworn an affidavit saying that never happened. But it's muddying the waters, right? It's it's getting too close to the people that you're working with, also the people that you're trying to be defending. So I think even from back in those days, and even she would look back now, and she says she does look back and think that that was silly of her and people when they're young do stupid things like that. I did account, because at the Royal Commission, a lot was starting to, before the commission started actually, a lot was coming out about her sex life. It's been revealed drug king Tony Mockbell used sex tapes to blackmail Melbourne barrister, a Melbourne barrister rather, turned police informant Nicola Gobbo. And I thought that's really interesting. I wonder if this would be the same if it was a male informer. And I'm not just saying this because I'm a woman, but I don't know whether the same language would have been used if we'd learned that a male lawyer had had been revealed to be a police informer. Mm. But there was a lot coming out about her sex life. And so I did a count of the officers we learned about in the Royal Commission, and I think I counted five over eight years. Right. And is it unlawful or was it, as you say, muddying the waters for her to be sleeping with these people? I don't think it's ethically a great idea. Mm. Yeah, I mean, especially if it starts to become a conflict of interest, which in her case it did in many occasions. There was one case that we touched on where she was representing someone who was asked to turn on his co-accused and one of his co-accused was a police officer and that was one of the police officers that she was sleeping with. So that's not a great idea. Yeah. You know, how can you give your client completely unbiased advice when you're sleeping with the guy that he's being asked to turn on? And he didn't know that, of course. Her client didn't know that. So you can see how very quickly you could get into some quicksand. In the early 2000s, Melbourne's gangland wars were escalating. What were the roles of Tony Mockbell and Carl Williams? That's a good question. So Tony Mockbell, she met on Valentine's Day, oddly enough, 2002, and he was charged with drug offences. He became known in Melbourne. He would climb to be recognised as one of the drug barons of Melbourne and indeed Carl Williams as well. So he started off as a, you know, minor drug dealer, lived in Broadmeadows. You'd often see him in tracky dacks and like someone you'd, as Tracy, as my colleague described him, someone you'd expect to see in a food court in your local shopping centre. He's really an interesting character because he was shot in the stomach in 1998 Mm. on his birthday and that changed a lot of things. That started a very dangerous tit-for-tat execution in Melbourne And it was all about kind of seizing control of the illicit drug trade of Melbourne. So you've got basically rival factions dueling for control. And in one corner, there was Carl Williams and Tony Mockbell. And in the other was largely the Moran family and the Carlton crew. And Nicola was getting close to not only them, but their families, wasn't she? Wasn't there sort of this infamous footage of her spending time at a a family event? Yeah, so she attended the christening of Dakota, Carl Williams' daughter, 
And the problem with that was Carl Williams had, she just recently secured him bail because he'd been charged with threatening to kill one of the lead detectives in Piranha, who was the task force investigating the gangland killings, Stuart Bateson. So Carl Williams had threatened to kill Stuart Bateson and Nicola had managed to get Carl off on bail. And so he was attending his daughter's christening. It was a lavish event. It was at Crown Casino. And she got up on stage and did a toast and she mocked Stuart Bateson. Here's that audio courtesy of Channel 9. I've been asked to make a special thank you. And a special thank you that Carl could be with us all tonight. You can say three cheers. No, you can. You can. Three, three cheers. To the boys at Piranha and in particular Stuart. She said, you know, three cheers for the boys at Piranha, in particular Stuart Bateson. And that was a dig at Bateson because he was chasing Carl. Now that's, even that is, I mean, you're getting into very murky territory there. You're at a christening for one of your clients and then, you know, she was having a jab at the police force at the same time. So to, pardon my French, but she pissed a lot of people off. You know, the the police force are chasing these guys. In their mind, she was a thorn in their side because she was helping them get out on bail. So they saw it as her helping facilitate their operations and keeping these guys on the streets. Did police think more was going on? Because it's one thing to sort of be representing your clients. It does seem unprofessional is not a strong enough word, but to then be attending christenings or, or events with their family. But they ended up putting police surveillance on her in 2003 and they sort of thought she was assisting those big-name clients in a pretty serious way, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And they were right to think that. They were hearing conversations that she was – she says they would have heard conversations that she was having with her clients and assumed that she was in it with them, you know, facilitating their crime. They did request surveillance on her – I think it happened again later and one of the guys in Piranha told his detectives, well, you know, stop whinging about her and do something about it. So bring me some evidence that would support an affidavit for a listening device or something like that. But they very much saw her as facilitating the Mockbell Williams crew. There's some really good stuff before the Royal Commission in documents, a police timeline of the reasons why Victoria Police thought she was in a lot deeper than what Nicola would have you make out. And this amount of sort of, you'd imagine, stress because she's spending a lot of time with big name criminals, the police are pissed off with her, she's trying to keep a lot of people happy and a lot of really serious people happy and the stakes are beginning to feel very, very high. She had a pretty significant health scare in 2004. Do you think that that was stress related? Uh, I do. She's told me about that era and... It was to do with a hole in her heart that she didn't know she had, but I also think it was brought on indeed partially by stress. The way she tells it, the question you just asked me about police thinking she was involved, she has said certain things to me about being asked by her clients to make cases go a certain way. So they would ask her to go in and represent certain people who'd been busted and do what suited them to keep them clean, if that makes sense, whether it be pleading or staying quiet. So that was what caused her meltdown in front of two police officers in the end in 2005. She said, you know, they're manipulating me to do certain things and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of them playing the system. But in 2004, just before that, she'd been involved in two big events that I think could have potentially, you know, increased the stress, which was she helped a hitman role on Carl Williams. And so she was trying to keep her role in that quiet. And then, of course, the infamous... Hodson murders happened, Terry Hodson, who was a police informer, and his wife, Christine, in Kew. And she was involved in, it seemed like, every facet of that. You know, she was involved in representing lots of different parties and I think had a few conflicts there. So she was trying to keep, (laughs) she was trying to deal with the wash-up of the Hodson murders. I won't go into too much detail because it's a very complicated case, but she was representing people from all sides of that saga. And then she had a stroke. She was accused of knowing that was going to happen, wasn't she? Well, I did ask her that. I said, you know, did you have any idea? And she looked at me with disgust, actually said, no, I didn't know. The reason why that has come up in the Royal Commission 
is to take you back a step. So the Hodsons were said to, who were alleged to have been murdered because Terry Hodson was going to give evidence against two police officers, Dave Meachel and Paul Dale. And the, the trio were said to have organised the burglary of a drug house in Dublin Street, Oakley. I'm sorry, this is very confusing, but one of the drug house babysitters, his name was Ahmed. And so to answer your question, and I'm sorry if I'm confusing listeners, but Ahmed was supposed to be guarding those drugs. And then the house was burgled. Terry Hodson was going to end up testifying against those two police officers. And then so Ahmed ended up having dinner with Nicola Gobbo the night of the Hodson murders. And in a lot of documentation before the Royal Commission, it's been suggested that he might have known that Terry Hodson was going to be murdered and perhaps tried to use Nicola Gobbo as an alibi. Right, because Terry was murdered along with his wife, who was not a police informer, and it's been described as one of the most significant murder investigations in Victorian history. And there's been suggestion that a lot of what Nicola did next might have been out of guilt, because if she did know what either what was going to happen, she says obviously that she didn't, or she felt like maybe she could have done more to stop it. What do you make of that theory that guilt might have been a motivation for her next steps? It's a strong theory and I did put that to her and I never really got a straight answer from her on that. She said or subconsciously it might have been, I think was her answer. I mean, Christine Hodson was just out of interest. She was registered as well as a police informer, but I think that's because she knew you know, she'd always be there when Terry would be giving information to police. So they were both registered as informers. Right. But when they were murdered, yeah, that's indeed one of the theories that a lot of officers have put before the Royal Commission, that in fact that she either might have known about it or perhaps maybe thought that she should have known about it and wasn't able to stop it, that that might have been a catalyst for her becoming a police informer in the first place. Gavin Ryan was a police officer that told that to the Royal Commission that he had a hunch that that might have been her motivator. And interestingly, a few of her police handlers have written that in statements before the Royal Commission. But yeah, as I said, when I put that to her, because it seems like it fits, right? Yeah. She said, well, subconsciously it might have been. And that was the most that I've ever been able to get out of her on that one. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. In today's episode, I'm speaking with investigative journalist Rachel Brown about the case of the lawyer turned police informer, Nicola Gobbo. Things seemed to unravel for her after that. And there's the day in August 2005 when, as you were saying before, she was rushing to court and she kind of broke down about how stuck or trapped she felt and that conversation that that she had changed the course of her life what happened from there the police then started using her didn't they she would say that she was being pressured to represent a client that she didn't want to represent she said that tony mockbell wanted her to represent this guy and make sure that he whatever he said to cops would serve tony mockbell so that was She says her breaking point that she was going to court that day, she'd called a detective in the morning called Paul Rowe and said something that he found quite remarkable is that, you know, I'm being manipulated, I don't want to represent this guy, he won't get a fair hearing. And then at court, she basically said the same thing to Paul Rowe, that she was being manipulated by her clients. And he couldn't believe it. I mean, this is basically the opposition giving him free intel. It would have been something he suspected, but to hear it from her mouth... I think he felt quite shocked by. And he said she was um, distraught. She was not sobbing, but crying a little bit. And so he said, well, we should talk more this afternoon. And so he went back and told his boss and said, you'll you'll never believe what just happened. So they drove her somewhere that afternoon and, and started taping her. And that was what led to her becoming a police informer. In the next couple of weeks, they handled her to a secret unit that was set up especially to deal with informers. And it was there that she met two men who would become her prime police handlers. And they they have the pseudonyms of Sandy White and Peter Smith. For people who might not understand the role of a police informer and the role of a defence lawyer, why are those two things so incompatible? Like what made that decision 
so shocking? Well, it's working for the opposition. So as a defence lawyer, her job is to ensure that her client gets a fair hearing, that their case isn't prejudiced. But as a police informer, you know, it's your role to feed secrets to police. So all this comes down to very dry and it'll sound boring concepts of what's called LPP, legal professional privilege, and conflict of interest. And with legal professional privilege, it's that sacred bond between a lawyer and their client, that information is to stay between the lawyer and the client. So what the Royal Commission is looking into at the moment is did she breach that? You know, did she pass on any privileged information that her clients told her to police, which helped police arrest her client? Or was she passing on information that she gleaned that wasn't privileged, that she might have heard at dinners or parties. She gave me a really good example once because I couldn't get my head around it. I said, how could you betray your clients? In some cases before the Royal Commission, she has admitted to passing on legal professional privilege. But she said to me that the the idea that the public has to do with LPP, and a lot of lawyers might bulk at this, so don't shoot the messenger, but she said that a lot of people think that every conversation that a lawyer has with their client is privileged. And she said that that's not true. That let's say I'm your lawyer and you come to me and you tell me about the advice you need for a murder case, that's privileged. Mm. But then if you then turn around and go, oh, by the way, my mate Jesse has just set up a drug lab in Strathmore, for example. She says that that's not privileged. And then you get into this really, really murky grey area, which no one has actually been able to give me a clear steer on, as to whether or not that she did the wrong thing by passing things like that on. Right. And the question that resounds throughout this whole case is why? Why would she start talking? It feels so dangerous with the people she's dealing with. It doesn't sort of really seem in her best interests. On the surface, it seems like it's almost people-pleasing, mm. like she didn't want to let anyone down. And so whoever asked her to do something, she sort of just said yes. Is that why you think she did it? Why does she say she did it? This is such a Difficult question. And I still, at the end of this podcast, I'm not sure whether I came to an adequate answer. That was my big question going into this is why. I knew the Royal Commission would be sorting out the what and that's its job. But I wanted to know why this high flying defence barrister would jeopardise her livelihood and possibly her life to give information. Because as far as I could tell, she wasn't getting anything out of it in terms of you know, she couldn't tell anyone. So it didn't help her reputation or anything like that. She wasn't getting paid to be an informer. I saw it as just a ludicrous life choice. And when I asked her why, she describes it as a cocktail of factors. So the first one is, I think she said once, to get the mock bell monkey off my back. And that goes to back to what I was talking to you about before, that she felt like clients were playing the system. It's a complicated, messy, misreported, misunderstood thing. But the reality is that it was probably a perfect storm and I felt morally and ethically challenged. And she said she was fed up with it. Another reason, I think, is that, and this has come through in a lot of the material before the Royal Commission, I think she, a lot of people will laugh at this, but I do think she had has perhaps still a low self-esteem and there was a desperate need to be wanted, to be liked, to be needed to be at the centre of attention. And so I think she went from wanting that from her, I guess, criminal social circle and feeling like she was the centre of attention there to then wanting to be needed by the Victoria Police Force. Because I could not work out how to not disappoint anyone or how to not let anyone down and how to get out of that mess, or probably in a way that meant I didn't have to stand up to anyone, which seems to be what I had an inability to do. How was her mental health in the years that followed? Because there were a lot of lies that she was going to have to keep track of. And and you say in the podcast that it's mind-blowing how she was able to actually do that and remember what she could and couldn't say. Mm. Did it take its toll? I think it did. And I think she wouldn't even realised at the start the toll that it was taking. I genuinely got exhausted listening to her tell me stories sometimes of what she had to remember 
that she didn't know, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, things that she'd learned that she shouldn't know. And so to not mention that and the number of people that she was dealing with. And she had a a lot of conflicts of interest. As I said, she was representing different parties from different crimes. I don't know how she kept track of it all. So that would have been a great stress. So many times I've just thought with her, it feels to me like quicksand. And I know a lot of people are really critical of her and I'm not an apologist for her by any means. But the more I spoke with her and asked her, well, why would you represent this guy when, you know, you helped get him arrested technically or why would you represent another person who you know you'd represented one guy who rolled who rolled on the second guy and then you've represented the second guy that's just not allowed and the way she described it to me was I almost felt like a quicksand scenario you know she was the harder she swam to get out of danger you know to keep her name out of documents for example so people wouldn't realize she'd represented certain people the harder she swam, the more she sank, I think. And I think, as I said in the podcast, there were opportunities for her to get out and she didn't take them. She would tell you that she didn't take them because she didn't feel like she could just walk away, that they would have realised she was a police informer. I don't know. I can't give an accurate assessment of that, but that's that's what she says. I just, yeah, she just kept getting thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker into it. I'm interested too in those relationships that she was forming with both criminals and police and it's said that she didn't really have any friends outside of that. That was her entire social circle. Mm. Do you think there was a almost like a power dynamic at play there because she lost her father when she was a young woman mm. and she's sort of suggested that she was always looking for that father figure and a lot of these criminals are older men who I imagine are pretty threatening but also probably quite charismatic because of the nature of what they do. Do you think that that's why she got so caught up in this particular circle? Why were these people her only friends? I think that's part of it and if you're spending like considering the hours that she was working just being a barrister and then add being a police informer on top of that it was like she was working to incredibly difficult full-time jobs. So she would be associating with her clients during the day, calling or meeting with her police handlers of a night time. And so I think one of the interesting things that I learned was that her social circle basically swapped from clients to police officers. And you're right, her, her dad did die when she was young. And we had a long chat about this when she tried to explain to me that in counselling she's had in more recent years that she thinks that yes she was trying to fill that void and that void at the time she says was largely filled by that handler I mentioned Sandy White because it was you know he was of the right age and temperament so all, all that mixed up in that cocktail that I was talking about of wanting to be wanted and needed and then you know a guy I guess that she felt safe with an older male that she felt safe with that she hadn't had for a long time it's, it's a very complicated cocktail. In 2010, she sues the Victorian police. What was the outcome of that? She has never said the figure, but it was reported to be $2.88 million that she was awarded by Victoria Police. And that was when she came out and pretty brazen show of her cards. She came out as a police witness. So she had agreed to testify against an officer called Paul Dale. And he was one of the men that was in the frame for that drug house burglary. And then he was a suspect in the murder of Terence Hodson. So she had agreed to testify against him. That all unraveled spectacularly. And so she basically came out and said to my colleague, Josie Taylor, I'd like to do an interview. And she basically outed herself as a police witness and said, they failed to look after me. This whole thing's been a shambles. I won't be able to work again. I'm in danger. And so she made a compensation bid. And yeah, 2.88 million was the reported figure. And how was her identity eventually revealed? Because people might remember Lawyer X, that, mm. that term coming up, and then her face being released to the media, which feels incredibly dangerous for someone who has done the things that she's done. Who leaked that? We still don't know. The Royal Commission's heard that a journalist from the Herald Sun, Anthony Dowsley, was leaked it by a senior officer in Victoria Police. 
Anthony Dowsley then called Nicola Gobbo, and I think it was March 30, 2014, and said, you know, I've heard you're a police informer. She called Victoria Police. It led to this frantic scramble for a late night injunction that night. And then I think the Herald Sun ended up going to print with the lawyer X story, but didn't run her name. And then a very protracted five-year legal battle then started. The papers campaigned to name her, Victoria Police's fight not to name her. And then finally, and I'm talking, this is five years, so it went through the Supreme Court and then the Court of Appeal. And then the High Court basically decided there's been a miscarriage of justice here. There are some people that she represented that needs to be told that she was a police informer in case they want to use that to challenge their convictions. That High Court decision was made in November 2018. And then her name was released in the last day of February, I think, in in 2019. And this Royal Commission that's taking place at the moment, what are the potential outcomes for Nicola? This is another really interesting question and I can't answer it. I'm sorry. I thought that the ending that the Royal Commission's findings in November 30 would recommend certain charges, perhaps against her, perhaps against the police officers involved in the saga. But we had quite a surprise about a month back when the council assisting the commission made its draft findings and and basically said to the commissioner, we think that you could find that certain people might have committed offences. And the commissioner came out and said, well, I won't be naming anyone because I don't want to potentially prejudice any future trials. So what I thought would come out at the end of the year won't be. So then I suppose this is where it gets tricky because the people that usually build a brief of evidence for charges is Victoria Police. So critics say that Victoria Police probably won't look into charging itself. So then you move on to IBAC, which is the corruption watchdog. And IBAC's already come out and said, well, you know, we would need double our budget and souped up investigative powers if we were even to think about, you know, pursuing criminal charges for people involved in this saga. So I'm not sure whether what will eventuate out of all of this, you know, a $40 million royal commission. I, I just don't know. But, I, you know, I do know that, as we said before, she's on the run. She's back in hiding with her two little kids. And for a lot of the officers involved, from what I gather, life is continuing as normal. Victoria Police has apologised. You know, it said it was a profound failure that it should never have interfered in that, you know, special relationship between a, a client and their lawyer. And they've said that, you know, process have changed since then it will, and it will never happen again. I'm slightly sceptical because this is just one case that we know of. You know, there could be others and and she indeed told Josie and I that there were two others that she knew of back then, two other lawyers who were working as police informers. Can you see a time in which Nicola can come out of hiding and return to Australia? No, sadly not at the moment. It's just, it feels so politically fraught at the moment. Yeah, yeah. The final question I wanted to ask you is, over the time you spent with her, were you able to at any point understand why she did what she did? Because you've spoken to her, Mm. I believe, more than any other journalist and, you know, built a rapport and she's an incredibly complicated character. Do you have any understanding of, of why she made the decision she did? As I said to you before, I think the closest I've come to an answer is that one of quicksand. You know, I think she wanted to be needed. I think she did feel pressure from her clients. How much she's to blame for that, I'm not sure. I still find her somewhat of an enigma. I know her a lot better than a lot of other people. She's let Josie and I in a lot more than she has others, you know, and she's been quite honest with us days that she's been very, very depressed. She's got PTSD and then lingering health effects from her stroke. And then she can have some really up days and she can be quite funny. You know, she's made me laugh out loud a lot of, at a lot of the stuff she says. She can be absolutely infuriating, you know, in terms of not <laughs> answering my questions. You ask her sometimes what she had for dinner and she'll start by telling you what she had for breakfast. And so I think Josie said to me once, she was never going to tell us anything that she didn't want us to know obviously, and I guess that's the same with any interviewee. But she did let us in a lot. And 
the more I spoke to her and so many times I just thought, why, why would you, some of her decisions seem so stupid to me and reckless. But the more that I sat with her and she explained them, I kind of thought, well, yeah, maybe I can understand why you did that. You know, maybe you shouldn't have represented this guy, but you thought it would help protect you. And then that meant you had to represent another person and another person and another person. And you just got stuck in this vicious circle. That side of it, I can understand. The exit ramps that she could have taken that she didn't, some of them I don't understand. So I don't know whether it's because she genuinely felt like they would kill her if she walked away or whether it was more of she was addicted. You know, she was addicted to that lifestyle or partly the thrill of it or being the police's secret weapon. You know, she is a type A personality. She Everything she does is 150%. So I think that's got a lot to do with it. As I said, I'm not an apologist for her. I do think she is to blame for a lot of things. I think she's got a lot to be sorry for. But I also think she's not the only one to blame. And so the really important message of this podcast, I think, is we need to be looking further than just her and the police that she had sex with and the clients she represented. I think that was... I would argue some a convenient distraction for some people that, you know, I wonder whether they were rubbing their hands together gleefully thinking, well, everyone's talking about all the sex, so we're not looking at the real issue here, which is how is that culture allowed to operate? You know, a lot of other lawyers knew of conflicts of interest that were going on. And Nicholas says, why didn't the Royal Commission investigate that? You know, that conflict of interest was becoming quite a culture within Melbourne and people just kind of brushed it off and didn't pay it much attention. So how did that happen? Why did that happen? And then we also need to be looking at Victoria Police because they did facilitate her use and they did encourage her use. How was that allowed to happen? And the detectives that hand on heart thought they were doing the right thing and, and, you know, said to me, well, her ethics is, is her, that's up to her to decide. Well, is it? Like, should we be having a conversation about whether that was also on Victoria Police? You know, it was also their responsibility to ensure that she didn't breach her ethics and her morals. So there's a lot of wider discussions that I feel like need to be had. And I hope that the podcast has been a catalyst for a lot of those discussions because she wasn't the only one in the wrong here. There are no innocents in this story, bar her children, from what I can see. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that the central question that comes through very, very early in the podcast is how is that allowed? There is just so much that you can't work out how that was ever allowed and then it became a a slippery slope. But there are questions to be asked about the beginning, I suppose, and that is a greater story that will take years and years to answer. The sad bit about of all of it really is, as Josie and I have been working on this story, is that I think, and I might be completely naive, but I think, you know, at the start, I think people genuinely thought they were doing the right thing, you know. Mm -hmm. She thought she was helping. She would argue she was passing on information that at the start wasn't the subject of privilege. Police thought, great, you know, all these murders on the streets are freaking out. Melburnians, we need to do something. We're losing control. You know, this might be our secret weapon. Police thought that they were helping her handlers. You know, I I do feel sorry for a lot of those guys in some respects, not all. They thought they were doing the right thing and they were acting with the imprimatur of their command, force command within Victoria Police. There's no one kind of villain behind the curtain, I suppose, that was pulling all the strings. I just think this has been as like a very slow burn of a lot of things that went wrong. And like I said, just people just sunk further and further into the quicksand and has left us all with the mess that we find ourselves in now. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jessie. It was more um, more akin to a situation where I felt that I had to prove my worth all the time and that if I didn't, then they would uh, um, effectively throw me to the wolves because if I didn't keep being of value to them and became valueless, then they wouldn't look after me. Rachel's podcast Trace is available on the ABC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. Head to our show notes to find a link to listen. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Our producer is Lem Zakaria. The executive producer of True Crime Conversations is Zoe Ferguson. 
If you'd like to find out more about the show, don't forget to join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook or make a request to join. What's your favourite episode of No Filter? Let's talk about sex with Tracy Cox and the M word with Dr Ginny. My all-time favourite would be Yana Pittman. Oh my God, I absolutely loved the Miriam Margulies episode. Join me, Mia Friedman, every week as I sit down with people who tell their stories very candidly and who aren't afraid to be all kinds of vulnerable. You can listen to No Filter now on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.